Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Before we get started this evening in our study back in 2 Samuel chapter 16, we need to make sure that we are spiritually prepared for our time in the word this evening. That means that we need to, if necessary, confess sin. So we always leave a few moments of silent prayer at the beginning of our opening prayer so that everyone has the opportunity to uh, confess sin, admit or acknowledge your sin to God, and, in the, uh, and instantly God forgives us and cleanses us of all, from all unrighteousness. So after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, again, we're just so thankful that we can come together, that even though it's via the internet, that we can all come together and study your word, be reminded of the truth of your word, be refreshed by learning these eternal truths that are just as real and just as significant and just as vital for our spiritual life today as they were 3,000 years ago. Father, we pray that as we study this evening, continue this study of the spiritual life of David of the situation that he's going through, that we might come to see that there are various points of similarity with the situations that we're going through right now with this pandemic and being isolated and socially distanced and uh, at home, not at work. And for many people going through a lot of different tests and a lot of different challenges because some are without jobs, some are uncertain if they will have a job when they go back, Uh, Many are uh, in situations with school or education that uh, makes their graduation uncertain, makes their uh, forward advance uh, uncertain. There's so many different things that are going on. And in times of uncertainty, we tend to give in to our sin nature. We tend to worry. We tend to have fears, anxieties. And yet it's a tremendous time to trust you, to grow spiritually by Uh, trusting you by putting our attention upon you, by using the extra time that we might have just to focus upon your word and study your word, read your word, memorize your word, that this might be a tremendous opportunity for us to prepare for whatever may come ahead by strengthening our spiritual life. And we pray that tonight as we study, we might uh, be challenged in these same areas to prepare for the future. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 16 is the focal point of our study this evening. 2 Samuel 15 is where we need to review because it has been since the 4th of February since we were in this main story, this main narrative of David in 2 Samuel. Since then, we've all seen quite a few changes, quite a few uh, radical changes even, in our, <clears throat> in our country, in our nation, in the world because of this uh, coronavirus, as I call it, the chi virus, because of the failures of the Chinese Communist Party. All the responsibility needs to go there, but that's a different story. What we have here is this <clears throat> incredible story of David in a time of uncertainty, where he is out of his house, he is being uh, spiritually distanced from the temple, or the tabernacle rather, from Jerusalem, where he is having to um, 
decide what he's going to do on the spur of the moment because of the rebellion of his son, his favorite son, son Absalom. So as we get into this, we're going to, I want to remind us that as I was developing the narrative here in chapter 15 and in chapter 16, that we see David going through several several situations. I've identified six distinct situations, six distinct events where he has to make decisions, where he has to respond or react to people, to events, and he has to apply what he knows. He, it has to come from a position of strength in his soul, and we only have a position of strength in our soul when we are spiritually prepared, when our walk with the Lord is solid and stable, and that's what we see with David. He is in a situation where he has to apply the word in a variety of different situations and different circumstances. So I'm just going to title this lesson, The Tests of Spiritual Growth, and we'll see how different uh, spiritual skills come into play in each of these different situations. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I want to do is just to give us an overview of what's happening in chapters 15, 16, and 17. It seems like this is a pretty um, a, a terrible situation with David. And yet, God the Holy Spirit has recorded for us these events in some detail. Why in the world has he done that? I mean, that's an important question we should ask ourselves. It's not the question, well, what does this mean to me and what can I get out of it? That is the least significant question that you should be asking when you come to a section like this. You should be asking the question, why does God want us to know this information? And we have to go to the New Testament to get some clarification on that. And we go to passages like 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, that the Word of God is breathed out by God. For all Scripture is uh, breathed out by God. The text is usually translated inspired, but it means God breathed with the Greek word theopneustos there. All Scripture is God breathed. And when Paul wrote that, all Scripture primarily referred to the Old Testament. So this is very clear that all Scripture, everything that we read through in the Old Testament is profitable. It's valuable for us in our spiritual life. It's profitable for teaching. That is instruction, translated doctrine. That's what doctrine is. It's instruction from the Word. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. That is to change our thinking, to challenge us. Because if you're living in uh, rebellion, you're living in a situation where you haven't been had your thinking trained by the Word of God, then <clears throat> you need to change that. You need to be, there needs to be a reproof there <clears throat> that that's not correct thinking. So it's reproof, you're thinking wrong. Now most people don't like to hear that. And if you don't like to hear that your thinking is wrong, then you lack humility. You can never learn anything in life without humility. Goes for me, goes for you. That's just, that's just standard. We have to be teachable to learn anything. So we can't be arrogant, can't focus on, well, you can't teach me anything, things like that. Uh, we have to be humble in order to understand the truth. So that means that God's Word is often going to step on our toes. I remember when I was a young pastor, there were a lot of older people in this congregation. There were a lot of younger people as well, and there was nobody in the middle because they had had a huge church split about 10 years earlier. And <clears throat> there were some people, some leaders in that older group that really didn't want to learn the Bible. But there were a lot of young people in the younger group that had <clears throat> moved into this er general area from Houston. They had grown up in strong Bible teaching churches in the Houston area, and that's what they were looking for. So you had some internal conflicts going on there. And I remember one time that uh, one time a lady, older lady came, and she said, you know, pastor, we're just supposed to feel good when we leave church. And I thought, well, I said, I'd sure appreciate it if you would show me a scripture that says that. And, uh, of course, she never could. She was always saying that. Because when you've got a liberal church background, that's what people think, is the purpose of church is to make you feel good, to motivate you, to inspire you, to lift you up, and not to correct you. But Scripture says that the first 
that you're instructed, and the result of instruction is you're reproved and you're corrected. Uh, and then you're given in instruction in righteousness. So that's what the scripture is all about. So when we come to a passage like this in 2 Samuel 15 through 17, we need to say, what is God teaching? What are the underlying principles? Because when we get into historical narrative, a lot of times what we're seeing is the story of how the truth of God's word is either being used or it's not being used. We see examples of unrighteous behavior. Uh, we see examples of rebellion against God's word and the consequences of that rebellion. And then on the other hand, we see examples of those who are walking with the Lord, trying to apply the word of God and living wise or righteous lives. And so in this section, what we see is not only this, this transition to uh, David in his rebellion when he's out of Jerusalem, when he's running, uh, uh, fleeing Jerusalem, fleeing Absalom, and then ultimately culminating in a physical battle with Absalom and his forces, that we're seeing what's going on in Absalom's thinking, what's going on in David's thinking. And there's a study in contrast there between Absalom, who is functioning like, like a pagan politician, now, we can go to the news and get all kinds of examples of pagan politicians. Uh, some of the examples of pagan behavior among politicians can come from some who are Christian, and some of it comes from those who are not Christian. So it's not necessarily restricted to a political party or, or a particular ideology. Anyone can operate uh, on power lust on greed or materialism lust and money lust, and the result is that this is what's indicative of, of pagan leadership, and this is what's in, indicative of pagan politics or po pagan uh, political power. And that's what Absalom's after. In contrast, we have David. David has obviously sinned, we have examined his sin in the past, his sin with Bathsheba, his sin to cover up his adultery with Bathsheba, his sin of conspiracy to have her husband Uriah uh, murdered. David committed those sins, and now we're in the post-sin phase when David has been forgiven, and he is going to be, um, he is still suffering the consequences for that. I'll talk about that in just, just a minute. So we come to this particular scenario, and I want to just help us think it through a minute. This is a lot like a movie. It's, it's a narrative. It's telling a story. The hero in the story ultimately is always God. But in the narrative itself, we have the protagonist, who is David, and the antagonist, who is Absalom. And we think of it as watching a movie or think of it as, as watching a television show, and we're all familiar with how... Uh, narratives, how dramas are portrayed, and you'll see one particular scene, and then it'll t tell you what those characters are doing, and then it shifts over to what another set of characters are doing. So in this kind of a situation, in a war or a rebellion, you're going to have one scene that focuses on what the antagonist is doing, and then the next scene is going to focus on what the protagonist is doing, what the, the hero of the narrative is. And then you're going to shift back. So we're going to look at this in terms of seven different scenes just to get an overview. So these are the seven scenes in the rebellion of Absalom. The revolt itself begins in chapter 15, verse 1, as Absalom is taking on the trappings of kingship, the trappings of royalty, is accumulating to himself uh, chariots and horses, and he's uh, getting men to come on his side. He's running down through various uh, slanderous accusations. He's running down the king, and he is winning the hearts of the men. Chapter 6, uh, I'm mean, excuse me, verse 6 says, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So this is the beginning of that revolt. And it is described down through, actually I have 13 up there, down through verse 12. The focus is on Absalom as he begins the revolt. And then from verse 13, 15, 13 to 16, 14. So that's the section uh, where we find ourselves. We're in the middle of that, where David hears about Absalom's rebellion. 
and then he flees Jerusalem. And we pause as he was fleeing Jerusalem to go over to Psalm 3 to look at that psalm to understand David's mental attitude as he focuses on the Lord, going to the Lord to give him strength and to protect and preserve him in the midst of this, this rebellion. And along with that, uh, some of that time since we talked about this, I was in Kiev, and then we had <clears throat> the pastor's conference, and then we've been looking at some of the other psalms that could possibly uh, have been written during this, this same time. At least they reflect the same mental attitude, the same spiritual attitude that David had uh, as exhibited in Psalm, Psalm 3. So we have concluded with those last week, and now we're back picking up this, this narrative. So David flees, and during this flight, there are these six different situations that come up where David has to make a decision. And that's really what a test is in the spiritual life. It is a set of circumstances where we have to decide how we're going to respond, how we're going to think, how we're going to act, what we're going to do, what our policies in life are going to be, and we're either going to do it God's way or we're going to do it man's way. There's no other option. We either, have, we either select man's solutions or we select God's solutions. We either select divine viewpoint or we select human viewpoint. The Bible is very clear there's only two ways of looking at things. And so we can't have this attitude that all roads lead to the same place when these roads have mutually contradictory foundations and mutually contradictory beliefs. You can't logically and rationally say that everything's really talking about the same thing because they're not. When Scripture comes along and says there's only one way to God, and that's Jesus, and that's what Jesus taught when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me, then either that is true or it's false, but you can't make that compatible with the idea that all roads lead to God when Jesus says he's the only way. It's either one or the other. So this is why a lot of people react to the Bible is they just don't like to be told that, the, that God's way is the only way that really counts. So David is going to flee Jerusalem, and as he is fleeing, he hits certain situations where he has to uh, respond or react. Then the scene's going to shift from David back to the capital, back to Jerusalem, uh, when Absalom enters into Jerusalem and various things that are going to take place at that point. Just prior to the start of the rebellion, uh, Absalom <coughs> was able to convince one of David's closest uh, friends, uh, actually his father-in-law now, since he's married to, uh, married to Bathsheba, this is Ahithophel, and he and Absalom has convinced Ahithophel, a very close advisor and counselor to David, to come over to his, to his side. And so this is a tremendous, uh, tremendous betrayal. And <coughs> we are reminded in 2 Samuel 16, 23, that, that uh, we're told, now the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one had inquired after the oracle of God. So was all the advice of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. He, he always gave the right advice. He always gave perfect advice. He was wise. He had great insight into situations. And so he was, his advice was highly respected. And now he's been won over uh, to the rebellion. The fourth act, or excuse me, the fourth scene, is that Hushai uh, informs David. We are introduced to Hushai during the time of David's flight, where David sends him in as a mole, as an undercover uh, spy, as it were, to subvert the advice of, Ahith of Ahithophel. And so uh, Hushai, having done that, then informs David. They've already set up, as we studied before in the previous lesson on this, uh, a, a communication chain between the sons of Zadok and Abiathar, and their sons would, would be the couriers who would take this information from, um, uh, from Hushai to, to David. And so he informs David of what Absalom's actions are going to be. And so then the scene shifts to Absalom, 
in just these uh, few verses, 2 Samuel 17, 24 to 26, Absalom begins to make his move against David. <clears throat> and then in the next scene, it shifts back to David. David moves across the Jordan. So all this time up to now, he's been moving from Jerusalem down toward the, the valley of the Jordan. And if you've ever been to Israel, you can, <clears throat> you can picture uh, that route. And it is a very steep route going downhill and a very dry route, and you're out, out in the desert. And then you get down to an area where there is um, there's various palm trees and various springs and wells, and that's the area of Jericho, which is very close. And so during this time, David and his entourage have moved down close to the Jordan, and now he's going to move across the Jordan, and then he's going to be resupplied with all of the food that they need in order, in order to continue. And that's described in 1727 to 18, verse 5. And then we come to the seventh scene, and this is the battle itself, where the battle is fought, and Absalom is killed in the course of uh, the battle. He's actually trapped by his hair in a tree, and then uh, Joab is going to uh, execute him. So the battle is fought, Absalom is killed, and David grieves for Absalom. And that brings us to the end of this story. So basically it was summarized as Absalom flees, then uh, <clears throat> which happened in chapter 14, then he returns, chapter 15, David flees the latter half of chapter 15, and then you see this back and forth between David and Absalom, and then finally David will return uh, to be the king. So just by way of review now, first of all, we saw that Absalom is deceiving the people in the first uh, 12 verses of chapter 15. He's acting like their friend. He's acting like he's the only one who cares about them when they bring their concerns, their, their cases, their uh, areas that they want to bring perhaps to civil court uh, in, the, in the capital. Absalom is way outside the gate waiting for them, and he tells them, David's too busy for you. He really doesn't care anyway. He's out of touch. He's had this huge moral failure. He's, he's been unrighteous. You know all the details. I'm the one who will take care of you. And so he's beginning to win uh, people to his, to his side. It's a false compassion, and, and he uh, has a fake sympathy for the people, very much like many modern politicians. As we've studied, he's driven by his sin nature. He's driven by the power lust. He's driven by approbation lust. He wants the approval of the people, the power of the people, and the wealth that would come with being, being the king, all of which shows that his sin nature is driving him. That doesn't mean that all politicians are that way. There are many who seek to serve God as they serve the people in their nation. This is definitely true of David, as we'll see as we go through this chapter. Second, Absalom, during this time, falsely accuses David of not caring, being out of touch, and, he takes on, and third, he takes on the trappings of power and authority. He's acting like he's already the king. And he claims to pe gives claims to people if he were the king, they would have it so much better. Then he deceives David, and he goes down to Hebron. And during this time, he sends out spies throughout the land to sort of feel people out and to let people know that when, when the call comes... Let's all gather around and support Absalom, and he'll be our next king. And so he is conspiring, number six here, conspiring to be proclaimed the king. And then he deceived 200 men in David's administration. Now, these men are operating out of the city of David. The cities at that time, when I take people to Israel and we see the city of David, it's really small. It's maybe five, six, seven acres at the most. It's not very large at all. The only people who lived there were people were the, the people in part of the administration, the military leaders, the political leaders, the priests. Those were the only ones who lived in the city of Jerusalem. Everybody else is living out on their farms. Everybody else is living out in the country, and they're just coming in when it's time to worship at the tabernacle 
are at the temple. So here are 200 men in David's administration who are deceived by Absalom and tricked into uh, doing things for him. And as part of this, he convinces Ahithophel to give him the appearance of legitimacy. So this is the setup when we come to the uh, verse 13 of chapter 15 when David is going to escape. Now, what's our background? Let's think about this in terms of the instruction. Uh, one of the verses that's important on testing on, uh, is, is 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which reads, No temptation has overtaken you as such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will, with the temptation, uh, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so what we're going to see here is these six different circumstances, each of which we must look at as some sort of test to see if David has learned his lessons, uh, lessons of humility especially, in relation to his sin. His sin with Bathsheba would have been caught, was an intentional sin. It was a sin that uh, would be defined under the Mosaic law as a sin of the high hand. There's no sacrifice for that sin. It was be, sins of the high hand would be taken care of in the nation on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And so David here is not only uh, committed a sin of the high hand, he's committed two that are capital sins. The adultery, number one, and number two, his conspiring to have uh, Uriah, Uriah murdered. God has punished him. Uh, David, first of all, had to come to a point of, of uh, realizing and admitting his sin and confessing his sin, which he did. And then following that, God forgives him, but God doesn't remove the punishment. We, um, we must recognize that when we confess sin at any point, God will do one of three things in relation to the sin. The first thing that he may do is he will void the consequences. And frankly, we're all grateful that in God's grace, he voids the consequences for many of the sinful, frankly, stupid, stupid things that we do just out of our own arrogance and our own sinfulness. And God voids those sins and cancels the, the uh, consequences. In other circumstances, he reduces the consequences. So there may be specific consequence, consequences. For example, with David, he committed these capital crimes. Specific consequences would be that he, he would be put to death. He would be executed. He, they were capital crimes. And God, who is the author of the law, is the, one who, is the only one who can uh, commute the sentence. He's the only one who can say to, to David, no, you won't be executed. And that is exactly what God did. But God didn't remove all of the consequences. In fact, he uh, allowed four stages of divine discipline or divine uh, judgment to take place in David's life. And this sort of came from David's own mouth, as we saw, that uh, Nathan had, had confronted him with his sin using a parable of a poor man who had one lamb that he loved and a wealthy man who had many sheep, many flocks, and who came and stole the lamb from the, man, the poor man and, uh, and, and killed, killed the lamb. And as a result of that, the, the poor man lost, lost his lamb. And so David is incensed by all of this and says, well... He should pay fourfold for his crime. So this is what's going to happen. Nathan says, so you will pay fourfold for what you have done. And at that point, David confessed his sin. God forgave him, but there's still going to be uh, a lesser punishment than capital punishment, but it's a fourfold punishment that involved the death of the child, then the incest between uh, Amnon who was one of his sons and his half-sister, Tamar. And then uh, Absalom, who loved Tamar as a sister, went after, uh, went after Amnon in vindictiveness and had Amnon uh, 
murdered. So this has just torn apart David's family. There's no peace. There's no calm in the family. And then Absalom goes off uh, in, uh, in seclusion for, uh, for a while, and then he comes back. And now we have this rebellion against David. So this is just a, a horrible time. But this is all part of the test. Now, when we look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we're told no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. It's interesting. The first 12 verses of, of 1 Corinthians 10 talk about the disobedience of the Israelites in the wilderness. So they're going through all of these situations where they're being tested, and they failed again and again. And in the conclusion, Paul says, no temptation or testing has overtaken you, such as is common to man. We all face these same categories of testing. But, and this is an important but, but God is faithful that even when we fail, that even when we're going through these tests or temptations, uh, God is going to be faithful to us, and he's going to be faithful in giving us what we need in order to handle it, even if we're disobedient to him. And so we're reminded God is faithful, and he will not allow us to be tested beyond our ability. And that ability for a church-age believer comes with the fact that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, we have the filling of the Spirit, we have the completed Word of God, and so we have everything that we need to handle any situation. This isn't to be understood as, well, if, um, if I grew more and matured more, then I would have harder tests. We all know of Christians who have had very, very difficult circumstances and situations and tests, and they aren't very mature. But God has given every believer from the instant of salvation the same resources, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. So God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with that temptation will also make the way of escape, not so you can get around it or get out from under it, but so, so that you can endure it. You can stay there and glorify God even in the midst of those difficult circumstances. Now, this word that is translated temptation is the Greek word parasmos, which has as its first or initial meaning an attempt to learn or discover the nature or character of something. It has to do with evaluation. It has to do with, with testing something to expose its nature. The second meaning that comes along with it is an attempt to entice someone to sin. Now, what we have here is a search, search situation that is a temptation and a test. That's why this word is used. It implies both. First of all, there is inherent within the circumstance an enticement to do it and handle it your own way. But it is a test to evaluate your character, to evaluate what you have learned spiritually to see if, if you have learned the Word of God. And Scripture describes these tests in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, as tests of faith, tests which uh, examine your ability to apply what you have learned. Not faith in the sense of your ability to believe God, but faith in the sense of what you believe, that you have learned the Word, just like you go to school, you hear several lectures, and then you're given an exam over those lectures. You, growing up as a believer, you learn certain things about the spiritual life, and then God is going to put you in circumstances and situations to apply what you have learned uh, in your spiritual life to see if it is, it, it, to, to examine your character to show that, that what you believe is, uh, has, has given you strength and developed your spiritual character and your spiritual growth. We all go through these difficult circumstances, and the issue is how are we going to respond? These are circumstances, these tests of faith mold us, shape us, define us. And that is what that they their purpose, to see what we are made of, to give us the opportunity to apply what we know and to reveal our character and to show how we have learned God's word. And so David is being taken through several of these at this particular at this particular time. 
Now, so three of these we looked at already. The first test is, I call it the Ittai test. Ittai was a Gittite. A Gittite was a man who was from the city of Gath. That was Goliath's hometown. And Ittai was a mercenary. He was a commander of a group of mercenaries that were composed of various uh, Canaanites. And they are described in chapter 15 as the Carathites in verse 18, the Carathites, the Pelathites, and all the Gittites. And he's their commander. There are 600 men. Now, these are tested troops. These are cutting-edge troops. These are shock troops. These are per, like professional soldiers, and they are well-trained, and Ittai is their commander. And so in this first test, as David has to flee from Absalom, Absalom, he is outside of the city of David. He's along the uh, Kidron Valley there, and as the people are going by and David is checking on them, he sees Ittai coming with his mercenary troops. And so this is a test for David. Is he going to just let them come along because they're, they're paid professional soldiers, so are they really loyal to him? Can they be bought by Absalom? Will they turn against David in the heat of the battle? And so David has to decide whether he is going to trust Ittai and trust these, uh, these soldiers to go with him. And this shows wisdom on David's part. That's, that's the focal point here. Is he going to just accept their word or is he going to uh, examine them to make sure that their loyalty lies with them? And so this is e exactly uh, what takes place. You look at verse 19. David decides to have a little conversation uh, with, with Ittai. And he says, well, why are you going with us? Uh, you're relatively new. You haven't lived here. You're not an Israelite. You're uh, a foreigner. You're a Philistine. How in the world, uh, why in the world would you want to go with us? You can just go. You're released from your, any obligations. And you don't, this fight is not your fight. And so it'd be very easy for someone who really wasn't loyal to David to, uh, to take that option and to leave. But what's important is to notice Ittai's response. He says, as the Lord lives. Now, this isn't just a trivial statement. We have people who make statements like this, this today that are just, it's, it's, they've trivialized it. This was a serious statement. In Israel, you did not swear by the name of Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, uh, unless you were uh, extremely serious. It would be like taking a blood oath. Uh, you can't get out from it. It was something that is legally blinding, binding. And because he's using the name of Yahweh, he is showing his loyalty to David's God. That he is, in essence, saying that, that we, wor we both worship the same God. We worship the living God, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, as Yahweh lives and as my Lord the King lives, in whatever place my Lord the King shall be, whether in death or life, even there also your servant will be. This is an extremely strong statement, and it demonstrates Ittai's loyalty and in turn the loyalty of his troops. And so David has shown wise leadership here. He has examined the situation. He's had conversations with Ittai. And so this gives him confidence that Ittai will be loyal to him in, in the rebellion and in the battle. And he doesn't just hastily take Ittai's word for it. So that's the first test. And it demonstrates a humility on David's part. He's willing to listen. He's willing to talk. He's not just jumping to conclusions. Now that's important to remember because we, when we get to the uh, fifth test at the beginning of chapter 16, David fails it. He doesn't ask the questions. He just believes what uh, Ziba set, tells him about Mephibosheth, and he, and he enters into injustice as a result of that. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So the second test is a spiritual priority test. We looked at this. This is a test of David's understanding of 
of doctrine. It's a test of his faith, his understanding of what he believes, what he knows to be true about the situation, what God has revealed to him, what God has promised to him as the king of Israel, and he has to trust that. And so this is a situation now where he sees that the two high priests, because we have two chief priests at this particular time, we have Zadok and we have Aviathar. We've studied both of them. They come from two different lines from, from Aaron, and they're both serving as high priest. And so he sees Zadok coming out from the, uh, from the tabernacle, from the, off, the, off of the, uh, what will be the Temple Mount. He sees Zadok coming along and the Levites with him, and they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is, is the f- visible, physical location of the presence of God in Israel. It is the center of their spiritual life, of the nation's spiritual life. It's the center of their worship. And so when they are coming out, of, uh, to, out to join David, uh, David has the option, am I going to let the ark of God go with us, which would be a spiritual decision that would remove God from the presence of the people. So the people could not worship at the tabernacle anymore. They couldn't bring their sacrifice. God would be removed from them. And so the test really is, is David going to make this a national issue related to the worship of God. Because if God has promised that he will uh, be the father of a, of a line that would sit on the throne, that's not going to be violated by Absalom because Absalom is a descendant of David. And so even though at this point Absalom, or we know that Absalom would not be the king, he wasn't the one designated, that would be Solomon. But at this point, Absalom would still fulfill that And so David is saying, no, I'm not going to divide the country spiritually. I'm not going to make this this a spiritual issue that weakens the nation spiritually. The Ark of the Covenant needs to stay in the tabernacle. And the priests need to stay there for the good of the people. So David isn't thinking about himself. He could be thinking, oh, I'm going to, this is great. I can take the Ark with me. And just as uh, the ark went into battle ahead of Joshua uh, during the conquest, the ark can lead us into battle and I can win and defeat Absalom. He's not thinking that, that way at all. That would be a very pagan way to think about God. He is looking at this in terms of what's best for his people. Uh, Leviticus 19.18 lays down the command that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, And David is implementing that and applying that as a leader. This is what's best for the nation. This is not what maybe what's best for him if he looked at it from a very self-serving uh, point of view. This is the difference between a statesman and a politician. So David doesn't compromise the spiritual life of the, of the people to serve his, his purposes. And he's demonstrating his trust in God because he knows God's promises, and he doesn't need to have the priests and the Ark of the Covenant go with him. So he is being a very wise. He passes the test. It's a test of faith. It's a test, once again, of humility to obey God and to make the right decision. Now, what's interesting in the process of this is that he sees that Zadok has a son, Abiathar has a son, and so he says, uh, let's use your sons to set up a, a secret network of communication. And so he lays that down, and uh, so he shows wisdom there. He's not just laying down and saying, okay, I'm going to run away from, from Absalom, and then God's going to have to do something. He is making wise decisions, but without compromising the spiritual life of the nation or without compromising um, the the Mosaic law. So he sets up this this secret communications uh, network. And then we're told that Zadok and Aviathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. And then in verse 30, so David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives. So all of this has taken place as he's going down along the Kidron Valley. And now he goes over the ascent of the Mount of Olives. That's the area where he begins to think through 
what he later wrote in Psalm 3. He goes up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, and he wept as he went up, and he had his head covered and went barefoot, and all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as, as they went up. And so this is an act of humility on the part of David. He knows that all of this is ultimately on him because of his sin. And so now he is demonstrating his humility. So he's learning these lessons. Humility is always essential to grace orientation. He's trusting in God. We see that from Psalm 3. He's exercising the faith rest drill. All of the foundational uh, spiritual skills that we all need to use every single day. So he's going up over the Mount of Olives, and then <clears throat> there's going to be a third test. Now the first two tests are related to people who are loyal to him. The third test is one of betrayal. And there's a contrast here. He's betrayed by a man who's a close advisor, a man who's been loyal to him, and this is Ahithophel, and in verses 30 and 31, he receives word that Ahithophel has been won over by Absalom, and he is now in Absalom's camp. And so this is important because, as I read earlier, when we look down into chapter 16, that Ahithophel's counsel was considered the, the, the best. He was the wisest, that, that nothing that he advised ever went wrong. And so he was highly respected. And so this would be a terrible blow to David's followers. It, it, it's, it's like a football team or a basketball team or baseball team that's just on the edge of winning and suddenly their star player is, switches over to the opposing team. And they just can't figure out how they can win now. So that's the situation. And whenever we are betrayed, the issue is very personal. Uh, it is very personal. We feel all kinds of horrible emotions as a result of it. And the issue then is going to be, how is David going to react? Is he going to make decisions on the basis of his emotion? Or is he going to make decisions on the basis of truth? See, when we go through uh, any kind of betrayal, we have various, various emotions that are all mixed up. We have anger, we have resentment. There's a certain amount of fear from the insecurity of the situation now that we have been betrayed by a, by a close friend. And so these emotions swirl around, and if we act on them, then we want to get revenge. We want to get back at the person. We want to express our anger in very physical, physical ways. And yet this is not God's standard. You think about betrayal in relation to God. God was betrayed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yet God doesn't uh, get, throw away the human race. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He institutes a plan of salvation that is going to be worked out over the coming millennia, culminating in the birth of the Savior and the death and resurrection of the Savior. When we come to that instant itself, there's another betrayal. Jesus is going to be betrayed by Judas, one of the 12 disciples, a disciple who never truly believed in him, who never believed in him, never trusted him, a disciple who looked like all the others because when Jesus was going to identify uh, the one who would betray him, the disciples all look at each other and wonder, well, is it you? Is it me? Who is it? And, uh, Judas was not a name that came uh, to the front of their minds when Jesus says that in John chapter 13. And even when he sends Judas out of the room, uh, they don't realize that he has been the one that has been identified as the betrayal. He was the last one that they would expect. So God has been betrayed by the human race. He's, uh, Jesus was betrayed by Judas. God is betrayed by Israel. Uh, Israel's rebellion against God many times in the Old Testament. God is betrayed by Israel when he sends his son uh, to come to his own people. And John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. So God is betrayed again and again, yet God's, uh, the betrayal 
of God is never a basis for his reaction. He is going to discipline people. He will bring judgment. But he provided salvation for all that is a free gift for all. And that anyone, despite the rebellion, despite betrayal, no matter what sin you've committed, if you trust in Christ as Savior, there is complete and total forgiveness. That is how God deals with betrayal, through forgiveness, through reconciliation, through redemption. And yet human beings, when they are betrayed, they react in horrible ways. They react in anger, they react in resentment, in bitterness, in revenge. They will withdraw from people, they will uh, take it out on other people. Uh, th they will take many different horrible courses of action simply because they have been betrayed and they're angry and, and fearful. We don't see David doing that. David understands what has happened with Ahithophel. He doesn't strike out. He doesn't throw a temper tantrum. He doesn't uh, sit down to devise his strategy because now he's going to get after both Absalom and, and, Ahith and Ahithophel. He is going to put it in the Lord's hands. He is going to uh, just trust in the Lord. And, that, and you see this in his, uh, in his prayer. If we look at verse uh, 31, then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. He puts it in the hands of God. He turns it over to the Supreme Court of Heaven. He doesn't react from his sin nature. So he doesn't respond in human viewpoint arrogance. He responds in trusting the Lord. In the fourth test, which is the Hushai test, Hushai was a close friend and supporter of David. And so as they come to the crest of the uh, Mount of Olives, then Hushai, uh, as he comes to the top of the mountain where he worshiped God, there was Hushai the archite coming to meet him with his robe torn dust on his head. He's demonstrating his grief. This was a common cultural thing, his grief over what has happened and here David rises above this occasion. This is a test related to pride or arrogance. You're in a situation and you've been betrayed by your son, you've been betrayed by your closest counselor. One way you can boost up your own ego is by getting more and more people on your side. So he could start off with, uh, he had at least seven or 800 people with him and he's thinking, he could be thinking well, when I get, by the time I get to the Jordan River, if I have everybody with me, then I'll show them. That would be arrogance. But he's thinking first and foremost, how am I going to take care of these people? How can, I, how can I serve them? His focus is not on himself. His focus is on serving his people, and he just can't deal with another mouth to feed, another person to protect, another another person that that he has to be responsible for. But he thinks of an of an alternative plan, and that is to send Hushai as an undercover mole into the administration of Absalom. So he's not re reacting in pride or arrogance. He is reacting in genuine humility, thinking of his people first, demonstrating love for them, loving his people as himself, loving his people first to do the right thing by them, and he's going to uh, use Hushai to go into the administration of Absalom and to try to negate the counsel of Ahithophel. So this is a test of wisdom and a test of humility, and David passes that test. But then when we get into chapter 16 now, this is the fifth test, and it's the test of Ziva. Ziva, the servant of Mephibosheth. And so this is a test of wisdom. It's very similar to the test of Ittai coming out. Ittai came out and said, we'll go with you. David says, why do you need to go with us? You can go, you know, you're, you're paid mercenaries. You don't have to suffer with us. You don't have to go with us. Just go on. We won't think any less of you than, than uh, uh, because of this. 
you just take care of yourself. And so David decides he's going to talk to Ittai and he's going to find out where his beliefs are, where, he, where his loyalties are. He's going to investigate the situation. In this situation, Ziba is going to come and Ziba just wants to uh, accumulate more wealth for himself. He wants to accumulate more power for himself. Uh, he has des basically deserted his master, Mephibosheth, who's, wound who's crippled in his legs. He Mephibosheth was the uh, grandson of Saul and the son of Jonathan. There is another Mephibosheth that is mentioned in the uh, second Samuel, and this is not the same Mephibosheth. This, he had an uncle, a, also, a son of Saul, also named uh, Mephibosheth. And so when, when he, David comes up uh, to the top of the mountain and goes a little further, at the top of the mountain he meets Hushai, goes a little further, and there's Ziva waiting for him. And he's got donkeys, he's got provisions for David, and he is uh, ready, to, ready to help David. And so we have to remember that in the midst of a political crisis, and we live, it seems, in this country from political crisis to political crisis, that where there's conspiracy, where there's rebellion, and certainly there have been a number of, of attempts to unseat, to impeach and convict our president, that are just made up out of whole cloth. And there's been, uh, and, and the results of all of this is that, that the nation and the leadership was so distracted when this was started that no one in Congress was paying attention to this uh, Chinese communist, this Chicom virus, and the president was. And he was acting very early. Now they're trying to say he didn't do anything. And again, they just tell lie after lie after lie. And that is what happens when you're involved in these conspiracies and you're involved in rebellion. And so Ziba is going to just come up and lie to David. He's going to make things up and describe this situation uh, with Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. So uh, David is going to have to make the same decision like he did with Ittai. Am I going to evaluate this guy or not? And he didn't. He just took him at his word. So let's look at it. This meeting is an, an, an accident. Ziva is waiting for David. Now, he is the uh, servant of Mephibosheth. We read in verse 1, when David was a little past the top of the mountain, there was Ziva the servant of Mephibosheth who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys. And on them were 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 summer fruits, and a skin of wine. Now that pretty much loads up a couple of donkeys. So there's a word here that is translated as a couple that some have suggested that he has a, a, a couple of, of uh, lines of donkeys where you uh, have three or four donkeys and they're all uh, lined, uh, lined up together or are roped up together. And so whatever it is, they have brought a lot of provisions, or he's brought a lot of provisions. Now, who is this guy, Z? Where does he get all of this? And that's a big question here. Is, he, is this really his stuff to give? We don't know. Let's, let's look at who Zeba is. Zeba is a guy, we'll find out, is totally untrustworthy. And he cons David. And David is, is trusting him. And this kind of a thing can happen to anybody. Anybody can be deceived. Anybody can be misled. Anybody can be conned. And what we see here with David, David's failure is he fails to verify. President Ronald Reagan was fond of uh, quoting an old Russian proverb when he was negotiating an arms treaty with uh, uh, Gorbachev back in the 1980s. A lot of people think that, that Reagan came up with it. But Reagan liked to use it against Gorbachev because it was an old Russian uh, proverb. And in, in Russian, it really rhymes. And it, in Russian, it's dovryai no proveryai, which means trust but verify. And so what we have with uh, David is just trust and no verification. It's interesting that when Gorbachev came to sign this uh, arms treaty in 1987, 
Reagan reminded Gorbachev of this and leaned over and uh, said this Russian phrase in Gorbachev's ear, and Gorbachev laughed and he said, you always say that. Reagan wanted to make sure he understood something that came out of his own culture that you have to verify. David failed to verify. So to remind you who Mephibosheth is, Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. He had been dropped as an infant and injured and crippled his, his feet. And so he walked with a limp and he wasn't able to get around. And so he was taken care of by one of his servants, this man named Ziva. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we are introduced to Mephibosheth and Ziva. And in that description, we learn that Ziba is pretty wealthy on his own. He has 15 sons and he has 20 servants. He's able to take care of a very large family as well as all of his servants. And there's just this subtle hint that where did this servant get all of that wealth? And so there's a sort of an underlying theme there that maybe this is ill-gotten gains. Maybe he is embezzling from his master. I mean, his master can't go out and check everything because he's crippled. And so uh, that's not real certain from that text, but once we get into uh, chapter 16 and then later on, we're going to discover what a treacherous person uh, Mephibosheth is. And he lies to David and in verse 2, we read, And the king said to Ziva, What do you mean to do with these? And he's talking about the donkeys and all the food. And Ziva said, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and the summer fruit, which was probably figs. So he's got raisins and figs. And this would be easy for people to carry. It's dried fruit and all prepared so that the, uh, and it's got a high sugar content. So he says, It's good for the young men to eat and the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness uh, to drink. And then David does ask him a question. He says, well, where's your master's son? Because Ziba had been one of Saul's servants. And so Ziba says, well, he's back at Jerusalem. Uh, he, he's waiting for Absalom to come in because he's backing Absalom. And today he believes that Israel is going to restore the king, uh, be restored to him as the proper king. And so he says that, that um, Mephibosheth is just as much a traitor as, as Absalom is, and you can't trust him. And so David makes this spur-of-the-moment decision. He says, well, if he's a traitor, then you get all of his possessions. So as the king, he could do that. And so he immediately just gives everything of Mephibosheth's to Ziba. It shows that he doesn't evaluate the situation, he doesn't get all the facts, and he gives everything to Ziva. Now, one of the interesting things, and we're not going to have time to develop this, is these last two tests, the test with Ziva in the beginning of chapter 16, and then in uh, verses 5 to 13 with the test of Shemai, where you have a test of humility again, you have two people related to the dynasty of Saul. You have Ziva, who was one of Saul's servants, and then you have Shimei, who is of the, he's a Benjamite, he's of the a clan of, and the tribe of, of Benjamin, and both of these men are operating on mental attitude sins, and they are filled with anger and hatred, they're filled with pride and self-centeredness, and they're filled with these mental attitude sins which drive them into these particular situations to deceive, uh, to deceive David. And in, in Shammai's case, he wants to just attack David. He's calling him all kinds of names. He calls him a murderer. He calls him a son of Belial or a man of Belial, a destructive one. He's throwing stones at David and at, the, at David's servants. So he's throwing rocks at, at David's uh, armed guard which shows that he's not thinking very clearly, and that's what happens when you operate on mental attitude sins. And he says in verse 7, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, uh, you rogue. He's just uh, cursing continuously. Actually, that's what the New King James Version says. The, um, 
Holman Christian Study Bible translates it, get out, get out, you worthless murderer. It combines the last two, but it should be, he's telling him to leave, get out of here. You don't have a right to this throne. You go, get out. And he says that twice, get out, get out, or leave, leave. And he says, you murderer. He is, it is literally a, a, a statement where he is saying, you blood, you man of blood. But what he means by that, what that idiom means is you're a murderer and you are a man of Belial. You are a destructive person that's out of control. And so he continues that. But what's important to note here is that what happens in response. See, Avishai, who's the son of Zariah, he, this is one of Yoav's brothers, Yoav being the uh, general, uh, David's general, Avishai says to the king, let me just take care of this guy. Calls him a dead dog, which is a, an insult. Uh, in Israel, in the Middle East, dogs were not pets. Dogs were scavengers, and dogs were sort of the lowest on the, the food chain. Nobody liked dogs, and so this was a great insult. Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Please let me go over and take off his head. So Avishai is ready. He's got his hand on his sword. He's ready to go just decapitate Shemai and get him out of the way. And this is the test for David. Am I going to react in anger and take this guy, take this guy's life, or am I going to react in humility? And David passes the test and responds in humility. The humility comes because David realizes that all of this is brought on by his own sin and that God is using Shammai to remind him that, that he has been a failure. And so David says, uh, he rebukes Abishai and he says, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? He's, he's really getting impatient with the violence from these, from these brothers says, so let him curse, because the Lord has given him permission to do this. The Lord has said, curse David. And this means to treat him with disrespect. It's that word we've studied a few times recently, kalal, not arar, which is the stronger term for judgment, but the term for to treat someone with disrespect. And so he's, he is dishonoring the king. He said, curse David. Who then shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and all the servants, See how my son, who came from my own body, seeks my life? How much more now may this Benjamite? Let him alone, let him curse, for the Lord has ordered him to do so. And the idea there is the, the, the Lord has sent him here to remind me that this is ultimately all my fault because of my bad decisions. And so he says in verse 12, It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. In other words, David, is, David realizes that there are times when you don't, don't need to respond. You shouldn't respond in anger. You shouldn't respond in revenge. You should just realize that there are some situations that are your fault, and you just have to live through it and go through it. Now, next time, what I want to do as we begin is to look again at the impact of the sin nature in these situations. Because in the first test, with the exception of Ahithophel, those men are friends of David. They are loyal to David. But in these last two episodes, these men are filled with mental attitude sins. They're filled with hatred. They're filled with anger. And as a result, it's clouded their thinking. It's divorced them from reality. And so they are putting themselves in a point of rebellion against the king rather than be being loyal to the king. And in Shemai's fa favor anyway, at the end we'll learn that he comes back, when David returns, he comes back and does apologize to David. Ziba tries to do that, but he's just treacherous at the core, and eventually David is going to tell Solomon that he's going to have to deal with Ziva because he's going to uh, always use his position to generate, uh, generate rebellion. So we'll come back next time, and then we'll go forward into this horrific episode that comes up in the rest of chapter 16 and on into 17, and then see how David handles this, how he trusts the Lord.
Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at these things and to derive these lessons as we learn that just like David, we go through situations in life every day where we have to choose whether we're going to react from our sin nature or respond from the truth of your word that we know, whether we're going to pass the test of faith or whether we're going to fail the test of faith. And more often than not, we all admit that we fail and then we pass and we go back and forth. And in the process, you use this to uh, slowly mature us and slowly bring us uh, to a position where we are more faithful in trusting you. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand these things, that it, spiritual growth is not something that happens easily. It's not something that happens instantly. We need to deal with each other in grace and kindness, for we're all uh, struggling, dealing with the enemy within our sin nature. And the only way to conquer that is to trust in you, to apply your word, to walk by the Spirit. And Father, we pray that you challenge us with these things in Christ's name. Amen.